we are recording now. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So today will be the last session of uh, classes on the unnameable, uh, and we'll try and finish the text. So, without further ado, let me just go to the last thirty odd pages that we want to sort of cover. Uh, I want to begin from this particular expression, which is used uh, at least three times in the book, if I'm not mistaken. On page 87, uh, we have the first occurrence of this expression, Indian file. It's an interesting expression, which is kind of almost out of use these days because of its obvious uh, racist implications. But there's a particular reason why this expression is used in this text because it wants to create that sense of the master-slave rivalry or the master-slave dynamic, which is also a racialized dynamic sometimes. If we consider you know, uh, that particular structure in relation to interracial relations. Uh, of course, I mean, again, it's very difficult to suggest that there's a very quick translation possible from Hegel to, you know, post-colonial race theory, there's, of course, that's a complicated area. We might actually talk a little bit more about it when we talk about Conrad eventually. But of course, there are some resistances to uh, using that kind of master-slave dynamic in the, uh, in, in, in the context of race theory. But uh, it's an interesting expression because usually, uh, whatever we understand about the etymology of this expression, so Indian file means a beeline. When you, when you go in a B line, in an absolutely immaculate straight line, when people do a procession in an immaculately straight line, that's an Indian file. But why this racial adjective? Because uh, the, the expression seems to have its origins in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the American context, where uh, the Indian file refers to the indigenous population, the indigenous uh, Americans. And often it would be understood that you know, they would be on these very narrow trails in the forest where they have to walk in a single file. So basically, Indian file means single file, right? Uh, the expression is used here, particularly to talk about, interestingly enough, the masters. So what we have around, you know, pages 87, and, and it comes back again around pages 90, 91, is this idea of a reversal. If you remember, we were talking about the, the reversibility of the master-slave relation. Predominantly speaking, it's the masters, of course, Basil, Mahud, and others, who are keeping an eye on the unnameable or the unnameable that sometimes becomes uh, warm. Uh, but on the other hand, we have this moment of reversal, which is quite interesting, and that's what I want to talk about through this expression, the Indian file, where the slave looks back at the master. So, of course, the masters or the series of masters, they are uh, keeping a certain surveillance on the slave. But we have this other moment where the slave looks at the master and uh, the series of masters uh, whom we see. And that's a very interesting moment, uh, which we have again around uh, you know, pages 90, 91. Let me just go there. Um, so, again, uh, on page 93, we have this you know, as I said, this reversible gaze, uh, we have left it behind, but commanded to say whether yes or no, they filled up the holes. Have you filled up the holes? Yes or no? They will say yes and no, or some yes, others no. At the same time, not knowing what answer the master wants to his question, but both are defendable, both yes and no, for they filled up the holes, if you like, and if you, uh, if you don't like, they, they didn't, for they didn't know what to do on departing, whether to fill up the holes or on the contrary, leave them gaping wide. So they fix their lamps in the holes. Okay, they fix their lamps in the holes, uh, their, their long lamps, to prevent them from closing of themselves. It's like potter's clay. Their powerful lamps lit and trained on the within to make him think they're still there notwithstanding the silence, and it goes on like that. I'm not going to read everything. But this uh, image of a series of masters who are now reduced to slaves in the Indian file or in the single file, and they're all doing this very strange thing of trying to plug a hole through which they observe the unnameable. So apparently, they seem to observe the unnameable 
from this particular hole in the wall and that's the hole the masters the master of these masters is wanting them to close and they end up closing them with their lamps so these are the lights by the way that the the unnameable sees so each uh, master may have a little hole of of his own to observe the unnameable right and they're now filling it out with all these lamps does that mean they're not observing him who is the master of the master again that question if you remember we had discussed the other of the other god being a logical extension of this question of the other in relation to speech when we speak the the other of the other when it comes to the addressee the fundamental addressee is a godlike entity as it were uh, which which could be anything which you know might be a secular entity of uh, any other you know figure of alterity that you may like to think it could be an animal it could be anything it may not necessarily be god in a very religious sense of the term anyway so i wanted to mark this reversed moment or this particular moment of reversal where we see the masters as slaves dependent on another master through the eyes of another slave the slave this another slave is the unnameable right so we have these you know moments where the power equation shifts uh, as i was saying the other day it's it's not a one sided power equation or it's not a very consistent power fulcrum it keeps changing right so let's just keep that in mind as we go along let me see uh, if there's anything else here that i wanted to mention before we go on uh yeah on i mean this comes much later but i wanted to mention it nevertheless on page 105 we might go to go a little bit back and forth today because i have a few things that i want to mention more than going in a linear fashion so page 105 the top of page 105 we have the reference to a particular song and those of you who have read read waiting for godo will be able to understand this will be able to remember this song right a dog crawled into the kitchen and stole a crust of bread then cook up with our forgotten what and walloped him till he was dead second verse then all the dogs came crawling and dug the dog a tomb and wrote upon the tombstone for dogs and bitches to come third verse as the first fourth as the second fifth as the third give us time and it goes on like this this is the opening song of the second act of waiting for godo and interestingly this is of course a very common a uh, song which is used or often uh, sung by laborers in the middle of you know their 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 sort of it's a very working class song which is often used in a sort of a uh, working class context uh, by laborers this song by the way featured uh, earlier than beckett if we think of it think of it in terms of theater history it featured in a play by brecht uh, i think it's called drums in the night but i'm not absolutely sure about the title uh it featured in one of brecht's plays uh, possibly drums in the night or some such title and and we're not sure whether Beck, beckett picked it up from there but of course there's this working class context uh if you if you like to the two characters vladimir and estragon in waiting for godo uh here of course it is not presented as a song and this you know what i've forgotten i've forgotten in the song itself is is mentioned which is typical of this entire text as i said the character doesn't know anything doesn't comprehend what is being taught and that's what saves him in a sense right the incomprehension or the stupidity is what kind of saves him uh let me just go back a little bit uh to see what else i want to mention from here uh just to go back to that idea of suffering uh the fact that they want to make him suffer and the fact that he doesn't suffer you know this particular dialectic because he cannot feel suffering right uh they want to make him into some sort of a representative sufferer in a very typical christian sense but that's not happening because he his body doesn't register suffering uh another thing that we see a lot in these uh you know towards the end of the book is a certain focus on fluids and liquidity uh it was there in the very beginning if you remember when uh tears were called liquefied brains now we as we go on we kind of realize that the unnameable may not be a solid entity it might be a fluid 
it might be a liquid, right? Let's keep that in mind. We'll come back to that moment uh, when that liquidity is kind of implied. Uh, in fact, announced, not just implied. Um, so this idea of suffering again comes back on page 95, as I was saying. Uh, we will also talk about one particular story, which then culminates into the ending of the book. Uh, but let me come to that in due course. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. So uh, this idea of a caged beast uh, is, is, of course, there throughout uh, the book. Uh, again, we see that a little bit in the word dungeon on page 96. Uh, this idea that the unnameable is like a caged beast. Okay. Um, the expression or the, the section that I had in mind that I was mentioning, again, skipping it a little bit further, on page 108, we have this section where the unnameable refers to itself as a kind of tympanum, as that inner ear, you know, uh, as an auditory organ. And this is the part, as I said, where we slowly move from the predominance of visuals to some sort of a counter domination of sounds. The, the idea that he keeps hearing sounds, these sounds are mostly tortuous, they torture him, they're not pleasant sounds, and yet there is an intentness in hearing these sounds. Anyway, before that, we have that section that I was alluding to the other day. Let me read this part. This is page 108. So what kind of a subject is the unnameable? What kind of a self is the unnameable? And this is one way of you know, looking at a response. Um, I've said it without a mouth, by the way. May not think, he, he doesn't think he has a mouth but he's saying words from where we don't know. I'll have said it inside me, then in the same breath outside me. And this is, as I say, there's no distinction between the inside and the outside. Perhaps that's what I feel, an outside and an inside and me in the middle, page 108. Perhaps that's what I am, the thing that divides the world in two. On the one side, the outside, on the other, the inside that can be as thin as foil. I'm neither one side nor the other. I'm in the middle, in the, I'm the partition. I have two surfaces and no thickness. Perhaps that's what I feel, myself vibrating. I'm the tympanum. On the one hand, the mind, on the other, the world. I don't belong to either. It's not to me they're talking, and it goes on like that. These days are words, you know, the, the plural pronoun is, is often used for words because words are alive and they are torturing the subject here. As I said, this entire novel could be seen as a kind of linguistic trial, the subject put on a linguistic trial. Uh, two points to be made about the passage I just read. Uh, the unnameable is a partition between the inside and the outside. That's one interesting kind of a positioning he does here. The unnameable is neither the mind nor the world. It is the partition between the mind and the world. Now, the partition between the mind and the world is not necessarily a human being or any you know, living creature. Uh, because, I mean, that's the, that's the complexity involved. The world, if you, if you think of it in any kind of objective sense, the world is not, of course, a uh, you know, a human entity. Of course, if you think of it subjectively, in the sense that, you know, Heidegger would use that expression worlding, or Derrida would again use that much later, following Heidegger mostly, that idea of worlding or world formation. Of course, world formation is a subjective process, but if we think of the way he's using the word world here, it seems like he's talking about some sort of an external reality. So the unnameable is neither the mind, the interiority, nor the world, the exteriority. It's the partition between the interior and the exterior. And that's because, and that's why it is neither inside nor outside. This is a very topological idea of the subject, which perhaps goes back to one of the questions that was asked about Mobius strip. This is a very you know, specific mobile kind of a you know, model of the subject, where the subject is considered neither the psyche nor the world outside. It's in the middle and it's like a partition between the mind and the world. Okay, so this is uh, page 108. Let's keep this in mind. This is an important passage. Uh, let me just go back a little bit and 
talk about other things maybe just trying to as i said cover as much as ground as possible um the idea of gaps that there are always gaps gaps in knowledge gaps in subjectivity gaps in the notion of the self uh, gaps in what the masters are trying to teach the unnameable it's also a gap in the sense that and this is on page 97 the voice stops and then it resumes so again uh, there are moments of silence, but this is not the kind of silence the unnameable wants. The unnameable wants a kind of complete silence, which goes beyond speech altogether. But this is more like a pause. It's not a silence. When the voice stops, of course, after a certain point, it resumes. And the unnameable doesn't seem to have any agency on the stopping or the resuming, right? And that creates problems. Um, this this idea of words being poured out of the mouth, uh, again on page 97, uh, the entire text in that sense is almost like a word vomit. It's like a symbolic vomit, you know, a linguistic vomit that is happening, where you're not necessarily wanting to say what you're trying to say, but you're forced to say what you're saying. And you're not saying anything about yourself. You're constantly alienating yourself by talking about others by half identifying with other stories. And you keep thinking this is not even your voice. You keep thinking these stories are not your stories. So it's a deeply alienated subject that we see. And the other has completely alienated the subject. But how does the novel end? That's important. It doesn't quite end on that note of alienation. There is some you know, uh, ownership of the voice and some amount of self-identification, even though quite feeble, that happens at the end of the book. I'll come to that. Um, um, OK, let's move on a little bit. Again, I mean, animals are mentioned, as I was saying, uh, especially monkeys, horses, lobsters. Uh, there are also moments when the, un the, when, the, when the unable seems to identify itself with a sperm, you know, with a cell on an occasion and uh, with a drying sperm on another occasion. Now, the sperm is, of course, important because it, it goes back to that joke about masculinity, about virility. But the sperm, technically, of course, is regenerative. And that's the whole point. The unnameable might be dead. The unnameable might be an unborn entity. But there is you know, some ironic promise of life here, some ironic promise of regenerativity. And that's what is you know, connoted by the metaphor of the sperm. Um, you know, the, the kind of mess they find themselves in, as I said, it's almost like a Dantean hell where uh, the unnameable finds itself, along with, you know, Mahud and, and uh, others. Mahud is also called a great weeper, a great weeper, uh, like the unnameable. But these are not weepings that come from sorrow. They're not sorrowful tears. They're almost mechanical tears, you know bathed in liquefied brain, the entire beard being, uh, you know, braid, uh, uh, bathed in uh, 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 sort of the, 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 the tearful rain, as it were. We've talked about this earlier. But Mahud and the Unnameable seem to share this particular, uh, you know, figure of uh, being a weeper. I'll, I'll come back to the weeper because it has a certain philosophical reference that Beckett was interested in. By the way, something that I didn't mention, I guess, the very first paragraph of the novel had a, a philosophical reference in the word effectic. There are these weird words that keep coming back and ancient words that are used in a very peculiar way. Effectic is uh, someone, uh, it, it, it refers to someone who is quite, uh, you know, uh, suspended in terms of judgment. Someone who's not able to judge a situation very well. Uh, or not able to become very confident about a situation. This is a word that was used in Greek skepticism. So uh, Beckett, from the very beginning of the novel, in a way, throws these words around that have very specific philosophical codified references. He's not a symbolist writer at all. But at the same time, these are almost like little clues or red herrings sometimes. Sometimes they're like red headings as well because they seduce you into interpreting the text in a certain way. Just as, you know, that word godo is a tantalizing signifier because it automatically makes you think this would be another version of God. But that's not exactly what it is. It's that symbolism uh, 
as a sort of stable relation between Godo and God that the entire play seeks to demolish or dismantle bit by bit, even though it uses many religious metaphors, as, as does the unnameable, as we have been seeing. Uh, anyway, let's move on a little bit. Um, Okay, I'm just uh, flicking through to check if there's anything else that I wanted to mention. Uh, the question of time becomes particularly interesting here. Uh, time in the sense that, uh, you know, we will see this particular moment. Uh, usually, think about time in a linear way. How do we, if, if we were to represent time by a line, usually it would be a horizontal line. Right? Time is usually imagined to be this horizontal line. But here in the unnameable, what we have is a kind of vertical time, a vertical time, you know, a time that falls, a time that heaps up around the unnameable. It doesn't quite pass. And as it were, it's the historical time of all the deads around the unnameable. And this would again echo a particular moment in Waiting for Godot when Vladimir and Estragon are talking about how the dead voices speak around them, how they rustle around them, right? So again, there are similarities here. Um, there's this sort of slightly funny little, you know, uh, episode or uh, a particular reference on page 103, where again, like uh, a very Kafkaesque kind of a reference, uh, the unnameable, because the unnameable is put on some sort of a trial, as it were, this is the record against him. And I'm reading some of the accusations. Insults to policemen, indecent exposure, sins against Holy Ghost, contempt of court, impertinence to superiors, impudence to inferiors, deviations from reason, without battery. Look, no battery, it's nothing. You'll be all right. You'll see. I beg your pardon. Does he work? Good God, no. Out of the question. Look, here's the medical report, uh, which is pretty horrendous as well. Spasmodic table, uh, tabes, uh, painless ulcers, I repeat, painless, all is painless. Multiple softenings, manifold hardenings, insensitive to blows, slight uh, sight failing, chronic gripes, light diet, shit well tolerated, hearing failing, heart irregular, sweet tempered, smell failing, heavy sleeper, no erections. Would you like some more? Commission in the territorials, inoperable, untransportable. Look, so it goes on like that. This is a typical, again, uh, you know, sort of a comic list of accusations against the unnameable from, you know, social, political to medical. You know, that's how the list turns. Uh, but I wanted to make that point, this idea of trial or this idea of a legal trial, as it were. Again, it would remind you, uh, if, if you're aware of that play, of one of uh, Beckett's uh, rough, roughs, they're called roughs for theater one and two, where uh, uh, I think it's rough for theater two, but I often uh, confuse them. It could be one as well. But in one of these uh, roughs for theater, uh, Beckett talks about this very peculiar kind of a trial that is happening. Two people are sitting on the table, reading from a whole book of accusations against a person. And this person is out on the terrace almost about to jump, as it were, but can't even jump, and listening to the trials. Uh, this character was played by uh, a person, actually, and not a cutout, because the character never moves, does never does anything. It's looking away from the stage. It's looking away from us. So all that we see is a static shape throughout that sort of 30-odd minute play. But anyway, I think it's, again, important to see some of these intertextual references and Beckett is a writer who often uh, cites himself and often older works become the ground for newer works. Ruffs, Ruff, uh, Ruffs for Theatre were written a little bit later, uh, uh, but, but I'm sure there were some connections uh, that were developed from one text to another. Okay, uh, there's another thing I wanted to mention here. Let me go there. Actually, let me go to that time reference because I mentioned it. Um, let me try and find that. Give me a second. 
So that particular reference where time heaps up is what I'm trying to find. Just give me a moment. Sorry, just. Maybe I could have highlighted them, but I didn't. Right, so this is on page 114, the beginning of page 114, or towards the end of page uh, 113. Uh, why time doesn't pass, doesn't pass from you. Why it piles up all about you, instant on instant, on all sides, deeper and deeper, thicker and thicker, your time, others' time, the time of the ancient dead, the dead yet unborn, why it buries you grain by grain, neither dead nor alive, with no memory of anything, no hope of anything, no knowledge of anything, no history and no prospects, buried under the seconds, saying any old thing, your mouth full of sand, oh, I know it's immaterial, time is one thing, I another, but the question may be asked, why time doesn't pass? Just like that, off the record, or per se, to pass the time, I think that's all. For the moment, I see nothing else. And it goes on like that. But you, you get the point I'm trying to make, right? How time piles up around the unnameable rather than passing. It doesn't quite pass. It simply you know, piles up or heaps up around the unnameable in a vertical way. And in the image of the grains, what we see, uh, almost quite clearly, in fact, are two philosophical references. One would be to pre-Socratic philosophy. And this idea in pre-Socratic atomism that uh, the world is made from these vertically falling atoms. So there are atoms falling on the void in a vertical shower and they swerve. Uh, the technical term for this swerve is clinamen. There is an unpredictable swerve among the atoms. And that's how they encounter each other. And that's how the world is born. If the atoms never met each other, there would be no world. Uh, Beckett was interested in this pre-Socratic philosophy of atomism. Uh, that's one. The other is this, again, uh, uh, the other is a Zeno's paradox, one of the Zeno's paradoxes that Beckett mentions also in that famous line from Endgame, where he talks about you know, uh, the, the, the grains of the old Greek and this is the, the Miller Seeds reference, where essentially the, the question that uh, you know, uh, Zeno is asking is if you keep subtracting from a heap of grains, and you know, eventually the grain has to be divided as well, uh, where do you stop? You know, this is the classic question with you know, any kind of atomic references. Where does the process of subtraction end? If you keep subtracting from something, where does it actually end? When does it become a void? How does it become a void? Conversely, you may ask the same question, but conversely, in, a, in, a, in the opposite order, when you keep adding little things, when does it become a heap? When does it accumulate in a visible heap-like structure? Right? So again, uh, the, the opening of page 114 and this reference to a vertical time, a time that doesn't pass, a time that falls. You know, It could contain both these references, as I said, Zeno and the pre-Socratic uh, atomistic reference. OK, let's just move on. Uh, there's that particular theatrical reference that I wanted to point out. Uh, this this idea of and again it seems to be quite clear that uh, this there is a sort of intertext here uh, with with waiting for Godot. Uh, so there's a particular point where a, a theater performance is mentioned, and the audience goes in uh, without knowing what the play is all about, but then uh, it realizes that the you know th that there is no play. In fact, waiting for the play to begin after the curtains go up is the play, right? And you also realize that you are in the theater alone, all by yourself. There is no audience either, right? So again, these are, uh, you know, that's the, that's the part I want to 
go to, this is page 107. Um, and I'm reading from the middle of page 107. He'll begin any moment or it's a stage manager giving his instructions, his last recommendations before the curtain rises. That's the show. Waiting for the show to the sound of a murmur, you try and be reasonable. Perhaps it's not a voice at all. Perhaps it's the air ascending, descending, flowing, eddying, seeking exit, finding none. And the spectators, where are they? You didn't notice. In the anguish of waiting, never noticed you were waiting alone. That's the show, waiting alone in the restless air for it to begin, for something to begin, for there to be something else but you, for the power to rise, the courage to leave. You try and be reasonable. Perhaps you are blind, probably deaf. The show is over. All is over. But where then is the hand, the helping hand or merely charitable or the hired hand? It's a long time coming to take yours and draw you away. That's the show. Free, gratis and for nothing, waiting alone. It goes on like that. This is page 107. That's the theatrical reference that connects, you know, the, the dots with, you know, Waiting for Godot. But it's not just the Waiting for Godot reference that I'm trying to draw your attention to. It's also this, you know, theater of solitude that Beckett is creating in this novel form. Um, it's, it's not just an intergeneric kind of reference. It's also the novel itself, as we have been saying, uh, which performs some sort of a Cartesian theater of thinking as torture. Right, let me move on a little bit. We will uh, soon come to the, the sort of final story, which is you know, almost at the end of the book, but let me see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Uh, the voices are mentioned in great detail here. There's also this sense towards the end of the book that the masters have departed. And the unnameable is on his own. And it's finally time for him to, you know, express himself. But then comes another story of Mahoud's. But after this story, something happens which allows the unnameable to finally reach that point of at least some sort of a feeble self-expression in his, you know, syntax of weakness as, as that expression goes, as we've been talking about it. Um, so we feel that the, the masters have gone and they're not going to come back. Um, but of course, I mean, there's no absolute certainty about that either because the story function, as I said, is, is always coming from the other. Uh, but, you know, this, ex, ex, uh, this impression is given on page 116, for example, where the unnameable says, now it's I, the orator, the beleaguerers have departed. I'm master on board after the rats. By the way, sewer rats are also mentioned in that whole you know, imagery of animality, as, as I mentioned, because there's constantly this idea of dehumanization. The unnameable is not quite a human being. It's anything else, uh, you know, possibly a monkey, possibly a horse, perhaps possibly an object, possibly sewer rats, anything but a human, as it were, or barely human, if at all. Uh, I no longer crawl between the thwarts under the moon, uh, in the shadow of the lash, strange, this mixture of solid and liquid. This is actually the point that I wanted to mention where, you know, this, this idea of liquidity comes in. A little air now is all we need to complete the elements. No, I'm forgetting fire, unusual hell. When you come to think of it, perhaps it's paradise, perhaps it's the earth, perhaps it's the shores of a lake beneath the earth. So all these speculations about where the unnameable is, right? Uh, we, we have, as I said, this uh, you know, idea that the unnameable is not exactly uh, a body in flesh and blood. Uh, as he says on page 122, if I could describe this place portrait, I've tried, I feel no place, no place around me. There's no end to me. I don't know what it is. It isn't flesh. It doesn't end. It's like air. Now I have it. You say that to say something, you won't say it long, like gas, balls, balls, the place. Then we'll see first the place. And another problem that we see continuously is that because time doesn't pass, because time is heaping up vertically, falling down, because of this movement, this vertical downward movement of time, there's no way the unnameable knows how long he has been there. There is no such clock time. There is no such you know, history of the place. 
It's a place that begins in every single moment. And this again goes back to Beckett's deep interest in one particular dialogue of Plato's and uh, the fact that he was also, of course, very interested in the fragmented poem that survives from this great uh, pre-Platonic philosopher, Parmenides. Uh, some of you might have already been aware of uh, this famous dialogue of Plato's, one of his most difficult dialogues, I must say, Parmenides. Uh, someone like Alan Badiou, for example, has also read this text in great detail. Uh, Parmenides uh, has this vision of one chunk of the world where there is no division. It's a very bizarre vision of undivided existence, where there is no division and hence no motion is possible. Think about the human body as the world, as one gigantic body that never quite ends. There is no division in that body. And as a result, there is no movement. If we had no divisions in our body, there would have been no limbs. And without the limbs, of course, we wouldn't have been able to move. We move with certain parts of the body because they exist in a certain divided form. There are gaps in the body. If there are no gaps in the body, we can't move anything. Like we can move our fingers because there are gaps uh, among the fingers, right? Uh, but but if they were not there, we wouldn't have been able to move it. Anyway, uh, this this particular idea is something that I wanted to mention. This idea of a you know a solid being, as it were, a being that is undivided and hence completely immobile. We have these Parmenidean moments in the unnameable when the unnameable thinks of itself as this stagnant sort of structure which cannot move, which is immovable, right? But this idea of the liquid, on page 120, we have this reference to the two vessels, one being emptied, the other one being filled. And then uh, the unnameable goes again, page 120, of being in reality one and the same. It would be water, water. So again, we come back to the liquid, the, the fluids. With my thimble, I go and draw it from one container, and then I'd go and pour it into another or there would be four or a hundred, half of them to be filled, the other half to be emptied, numbered, the even to be emptied, the uneven to be filled. So he creates this sort of a mathematical series of all these vessels, one to be emptied, the other to be filled up. And this is the job of the unnameable, as it were, to the point that the unnameable himself becomes this water, this water that flows from one vessel to another. It goes by, you know, filling up one, uh, you know, brimming it up and, and emptying the other. But what we see here is also a sense of balance, a balance between, you know, lack and excess, a balance between emptiness and fullness, right? And again, if you remember Waiting for God, one of the famous remarks which Beckett mentions in Malone Dies again is, don't despair, one of the thieves was saved. Don't hope, one of the thieves was damned. You know, this is the famous biblical story that is narrated in uh, Waiting for Godot. Possibly he got this from St. Augustine. He was a great admirer of St. Augustine and especially uh, Confessions by St. Augustine. Anyway, uh, this, this idea of a balance between hope and despair is something that we always see in Beckett. And this brings me to that other point about the weeping and the laughing. Uh, as you know, in Greek philosophy, uh, Democritus is the laughing philosopher, right? And Heraclitus is the weeping philosopher. But Beckett always insisted on some sort of a balance between the two, a balance between tragedy and comedy, and hence Waiting for Godot was called a tragic comedy. And that balance is always there in a Beckett text, even in much more daunting texts, as if the unnameable is not daunting. But anyway, in a, in a, in a really daunting text like how it is, you still have these bouts of humor or what the text himself itself calls, you know, uh, a sense of humor that is deteriorated, as it were, a deterioration of the sense of humor. Anyway, uh, which is again a humor in itself. But this idea that there is a weeping philosopher and a laughing philosopher and they balance each other. Democritus and Heraclitus balance each other like hope and despair balance each other. One of the thieves was saved, so do not despair. One of the thieves was damned, so do not hope. Now, uh, the, the word abderite, which refers to Democritus, uh, appears, in fact, um, 
on page 129. So that's the reason I wanted to mention this. You know, it says, he he, that's the Abderite. He he is, of course, the, the smile, right? The laugh. Uh, no, the other, in the end, it's the end. And anyway, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to mention this. Uh, there's this uh, hilarious letter where Beckett is asked about tragedy and comedy and what dominates. Is it the tragic that dominates or the comic? And Beckett says, well, look at Democritus uh, laughing. And let's say Democritus is laughing as he's facing Heraclitus, who is weeping. Now you tell me, is Democritus laughing because Heraclitus is weeping? Or is Heraclitus weeping because Democritus is laughing? What does that show? It shows that it's impossible to know which one is causing what when you see a weeper and a laugher, you know, if, if, if you see someone having a guffaw on the one hand and another person weeping, and if they're facing each other, you don't know whether it's the laughter that has caused the, uh, the weeping or the weeping that has caused the laughter. Such is the undecidability when it comes to the categories of tragedy and comedy. Uh, that's the last point I will make. Before we finish, I will quickly talk about the last story. It's a, it's a very interesting story. Uh, this is a story about, um, about um, the war, but also about love. And uh, it's mentioned, in fact, in a very insightful reading uh, about how stories are used uh, for you know, affective purposes or how stories are sometimes used to teach affect, teach emotion. Martha Nussbaum, in her famous work on emotions, uh, makes a detailed reading of this particular story uh, of, uh, of the unnameable. Anyway, this is on page 128. We are right at the end. So just bear with me as I go through this story. It, it is half a page and it's told in a, in a very cliched way. The story itself is cliched. This is perhaps the last of Mahud's stories, last of the others' stories that we have in this book. 128, more or less at the top. They love each other. They love each other, sorry. Marry in order to love each other better, more conveniently. He goes to the wars. He dies at the wars. She weeps with emotion at having loved him, at having lost him. Yep, marries again in order to love again, more conveniently again. They love each other. You love as many times as necessary, as necessary in order to be happy. He comes back. The other comes back from the wars. He didn't die at the wars after all. She goes to the station to meet him. He dies in the train of emotion at the thought of seeing her again, having her again. She weeps, weeps again, with emotion again, at having lost him again. Yep, goes back to the house. He's dead. The other is dead. The mother-in-law takes him down. He hanged himself with emotion at the thought of losing her. She weeps, weeps louder at having loved him, at having lost him. There's a story for you. That was to teach me the nature of emotion. That's called emotion. What emotion can do, given favorable conditions, what love can do. Well, well, so that's emotion. That's love and trains, the nature of trains and the meaning of your back to the engine. It goes on in a sort of slightly funny way. But this story, of course, it's a very cliched war narrative. A soldier goes to war, dies in the war, the or thinks uh, the the family thinks it, the soldier is dead. The wife remarries uh, after a few years. The soldier comes back. He never died. Uh, but then the rest of it is, of course, absolute melodrama, right? The content of the story, and of course, Beckett is uh, making a dig at a very typical, realistic emotional narrative, and he's also eclipsing it by contracting it to the point of you know not even a paragraph. This is a, a sentimental novel that can be written out in 250 pages. He just doesn't even write 250 words for it, right? So the story is, of course, mocking the very idea of realistic storytelling. But it's also about, as I said, the affective balance between laughing and weeping, between Democritus and Heraclitus. Why? If you, if you follow... because he was so happy to meet his wife after all these years. The other one, the second husband, dies because of sadness. He, he sort of almost weeps his way to death, hangs himself, commits suicide because he knows that maybe his wife will not be his wife anymore now that the first husband is back. So both husbands are gone. 
And then she's weeping. She's the final weeper, as it were. So in the very story, you have this balance, but of course, again, a comic balance between weeping and laughing, between the Democritian Act and the Heraclitian Act, as it were. That's one thing I wanted to mention, but there's something more, which is again, very funny at one level. Uh, the, the, the narrator uh, develops this kind of an obsession, as it were, with the figure of the door. The question is, the, it's all about the door. OK, uh, let me let me read this. This is also the end towards the end of page 128. Uh, so the question is, who bolted the house door? Right. Um, he, her cries rend the heart as she takes down her son or son in law. I don't know. It must be her son since she cries. And the door, the house door is bolted. When she got back from the station, she found the house door bolted. Who bolted it? He the better to hang himself? Or the mother-in-law, the better to make him down, to take him down, or to prevent her daughter-in-law from re-entering the premises? There's a story for you. It must be the daughter-in-law. It isn't the son-in-law and the daughter. It's the daughter-in-law and the son. How I reason to be sure this evening. It was to teach me how to reason. So this rationalist question is, of course, made fun of. The rationalist question being, who bolted the door? The man who killed himself, of course, could not have bolted the door from outside. So it must have been the mother or the mother-in-law. We don't know who, right? But why did she do that? Did she do that at the first place? This rational or, again, if you think about it, this is a typical realistic question, right? You, you ask these questions, you know, about logical fallacy, about logical inconsistency in a realistic narrative. In a narrative such as the unnameable, it's very difficult to ask these questions. They don't hold. But nevertheless, it's this door that interests the narrator. And he goes on to say on the same page, 128, it wasn't I, the door. It's the door interests me, a wooden door. Who bolted the door? And for what purpose? I'll never know. There's a story for you. So again, the story cuts away from knowledge. It doesn't offer all the knowledges of the world that we may want it to offer. It's not a Joycean epiphanic narration. It's more like a narration that takes away from knowledge, that cuts away from knowledge, as, as Beckett would always, you know, contrast himself with Joyce by saying Joyce was a knower. I'm a non-knower. I'm a non-canner, he also said, again, using can, the, the verb there. Anyway, I want to draw your attention to the final sort of movement of this door and how this wooden door, which is literally a trope in the story, a literal door, how this literal door becomes a metaphorical door. And this is the door on the unnameable's story. Finally, this Mahud story, the last story of Mahud's, opens up this door because this question is asked by the unnameable. So see this little mode of resistance. He was not asking any questions about the credibility of any of these other stories told by the masters. This is the first time he asks a question, raises his voice and asks a question about the credibility of one of the master's stories. And the question is, who bolted the door? As innocuous as it may sound, it is still a question. And that question leads him to the metaphorical door that would finally open on his story, the story that he has been trying to tell forever the story that will close this narration once and for all. The story that will lead to the end of the narrative. And this is how the metaphorical door comes back in the last you know, couple of pages of the story. You know, uh, we have the, the same kind of narration goes on. But on page 132, we have the door again. It will show me my hiding place. What's, what's it like? What's, what it's like? where the door is, if there's a door, and whereabouts I am in it, and what lies between us, how the land lies. So you see how the door comes back on page 132. Again, at the end of the door, uh, at the end of the page, we have, it calls that living, the space of the way from here to the door. It's all there in what I hear. And again, the door on page 133, uh, find the door, find the ax, perhaps it's a cord, for the neck 
for the throat, for the cords or fingers. I'll have the, I'll have eyes. I'll see fingers. It will be the silence. Perhaps it's a drop. Find the door. Open the door. Drop into the silence. It won't be I. I'll stay here or there, more likely there. And again, the door that opens closes again on page 133, which is the sort of the penultimate page of uh, the, the novel. And again, on 134, we have the door. Through the door into the silence. That must be it. It's too late. Perhaps it's too late. Perhaps they have. How would I know? In the silence, you don't know. Perhaps it's the door. Perhaps I'm at the door. <coughs> that would surprise me. Perhaps it's I. Perhaps some. Somewhere or other, it was I. I now, door. What door? What's a door doing here? It's the last words. So <coughs> the door becomes metaphorical. The door is also a word, D double O R door. So again, you see a mutation, a mutation of the material door, the wooden door, into a symbolic door, a door which is a, a symbolic entity, the last words. But this door finally opens the unnameable to his own story. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let me just read the last few sentences and we're done. Um, perhaps they've carried me to the threshold of my story. This is the end of page 134. Me to the threshold of my story before the door that opens on my story. That would surprise me if it opens. It will be I. It will be the silence where I am. I don't know. I'll never know. In the silence, you don't know. You must go on. I can't go on, I'll go on. So that's how the novel ends. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that it ends with a, at least a, an iota of self-identification and a promise of that story about the self only because finally the unnameable is able to resist the story of the other by asking a question. A question for which the other doesn't really have an answer. Who bolted the door? Um, we come to a, a point where the door opens, the space of the door opens, <coughs> and unnameable drops into that silence, that silence of non-self. But ironically, the silence of non-self is also the silence of the self, where the self is finally identified with. And hence, this paradoxical contradiction, uh, which is often considered a sort of Kantian imperative in Beckett, you must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on. So there's a tripartite structure, like a dialectical process. So it's like a Kantian dialectic, as it has often been pointed out. It's a negative dialectic, to put it like Adorno, or maybe a kind of a aporetic dialectic to put it like uh, Beckett, as he puts it here in The Unnameable. Uh, this uh, hesitation between on and no is always there in Beckett. Uh, on and no are like a palindromic sequence. If you transpose the letters of on, O, N, you get N, O, no. So this contradiction is written on, at the very lexical level of the two signifiers. On means continuation. No means negation. It could be the no of stopping. So you can't continue. You stop. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. And as I said, the I can't go on. I'm just trying to jog your memory here. The I can't go on was not there in the original French text. It was imported back into the French text from the English text much later in the 70s, after Beckett did this translation in 57-58. <clears throat> Let's stop here. We have run out of time, but I've been able to somehow rush through and finish this. Uh, questions for five minutes maximum, if if there are questions. Yes, he don't mind. Go ahead. You might unmute yourself and talk. That will be quicker, right? Sir, am I audible? Yes. Sir, can the unnameable be called post-human? Hmm. 
so it 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 has been to a certain extent i mean again we don't have the time but i would uh, perhaps uh, you know direct you to uh, jonathan bolter's work uh, there are two books to be read in this context one is uh, beckett a guide for the perplexed which a long time back used to be there in the british council library i'm sure you'll also find some e copy somewhere uh, uh, beckett a guide for the perplexed by jonathan bolter where he talks about the post human possibilities of this entity uh, bolter has actually gone on to write a separate book on post human spaces in beckett's later fiction so post humanism is something that has been uh, engaged with in in beckett studies let that be a short answer there could be a longer answer but yeah let's not get into that but yeah it's definitely an interpretive possibility <clears throat> any other question okay if not we could call it a day uh, i think i'll i'll of course uh, double check the times but i think uh, i'll be doing the conrad text almer's folly with you and that should be somewhere in between 7th and 10th if i'm not mistaken or 6th or 9th another you know four classes it's not a long text but uh, i would urge you to perhaps read it before we come to class if possible uh, and of course if you have any residual questions about that name we could quickly start with that in the next class and then move over to conrad again we don't we, we won't be able to devote a lot of time to beckett because of this uh, because of the other novel anyway if you if you think of other questions feel free to write to me uh, from the batch id you could i mean one of you could collate questions if there are questions that will be more systematic rather than you know multiple emails uh, one of you could please collate the questions and uh, write to me from the batch id and i'll respond to them okay uh, yeah thank you so much for being such patient audience to what I hope was somewhat fruitful at least. Let me stop the recording here.